All right, hey guys. So today is the last slide lecture for the trimester. So the way we're gonna do this is I'll do the slide lecture today. You'll get a normal assignment tomorrow and Friday will be just dedicated for you to work on your rough draft for those of you guys who have not done it already. And I've already started to get several in. So um, I am glad that I did post that early instead of waiting until Friday to do it. All right, guys, so we are gonna talk about disorders today. I didn't realize my light was that bright. So give me a second. I will spin around because that light's bothering me. All right, so I am going to teach you about disorders, and this is normally two separate classes, uh, so hopefully it doesn't run too long today. Uh, we are going to talk first about mental disorders, and then we're going to talk about psych uh, psychiatric disorders. All right, so when we talk mental disorders, the first one that comes up is anxiety. Anxiety is something that is a part of your life. No matter how comfortable you are, there are going to be points in your life that you're going to have anxiety. Now, it is not a condition until it starts to affect your everyday life. All right. And it becomes very persistent. So just because during final exam time frame or now that's the end of the school year, your anxiety up real high, but once you're done, you know, you go back to a normal and it doesn't persist then you're okay. So like high anxiety is you're going to go through it. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be nervous about stuff, so on and so forth. All right. So there's several types. So we're going to talk about five. Uh, and these are the five most common. So you have generalized anxiety disorder. And we're going to go into these a little bit more. Um, this is just, you're just generally nervous and uneasy. You have panic disorder, which is sudden episodes of intense dread. And we'll talk about panic attacks later. Phobic, this is where you have an irrational fear of something. It could be anything. Uh, obsessive compulsive, which is OCD. And these are repetitive thoughts and actions. So guys, a lot of you say you have OCD. You probably don't. It's actually a very rare one. But if you have been diagnosed or if you have repetitive and per, uh, persistent thoughts that you can't get out of your head, and we'll talk about that, then you may end up having OCD. All right, and then you have PTSD, and this is post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of you guys know this as a military thing, but it's not just a military thing. If you have been abused, if you went through a bad car accident, if you had something terrible happen to you, you may suffer from PTSD, whether you know it or not. Okay, so let's talk generalized anxiety disorder of this. And this is actually probably the most common form of anxiety. And this is, is what we think about when we think of someone with anxiety. They're just worried about everything. And so they're not, just because you have this doesn't mean you're constantly uh, worried. You go through kind of episode. So you have episodes where you're so worried about everything that you cannot get the persuasive thoughts out of your head and you can have symptoms, physical symptoms of anxiety. So sweaty palms, you can actually have your throat close up, erratic bleeding, heart, heart going everywhere, trembling, and super sweaty. It's outstanding. Um, I actually have general anxiety disorder, so I get this a lot. Now, like I said, on normal days, you might be fine, and the next day you may not, and that's just kind of one of those things. But this is not panic disorder. We're going to talk about having a panic attack next. Most of the people who have this are women, um, for whatever reason, and it's just, just a constant worry about something. Um, and you can't necessarily concentrate on one thing because you're constantly worried and you switch from topic to topic to topic to topic. Uh, the worst part of this disorder is that when you have an anxiety episode is you don't always know what is actually the true cause of your anxiety. All right. A lot of times the stuff that in your head at that moment is causing anxiety, you sit there and you're like, this is not that big of a deal, but it is because there is some kind of underlying cause um, and it's just causing you to fret about everything. All right. Uh, the thing is, what's interesting is that even though this is very intense in your younger years, a lot of times you actually mellow out in your 50s and 60s and the uh, general anxiety calms down. So that's kind of some good news. So if you do end up getting this, 
And like, I wasn't actually even diagnosed until uh, a couple years back. So like, in all honesty, like it, this can kind of hit whenever. And, you know, like for me, I know I've had anxiety my entire life, but I was always able to manage it until I wasn't. And that's when I ended up having to go see and have to go through this. Um, so GAD is interesting. And for the most part, it is manageable without medication. But if it does get to the point that you can no longer manage, then there's medication to help calm it down. And it just takes the edge off. Like you're not, you're just not constantly worried. And when you do worry, you're not as spastic about it, where everything is the end of the world. Instead, it's kind of just a little bit more mellow. It kind of takes that edge down. But let's talk about panic attacks. Okay. So we talked about general anxiety and they still come in kind of episodes. Panic attack episodes though are very short in duration, but the physical impact it has on you is incredibly intense, All right? It strikes suddenly and it's just like you feel like someone is pressing down on your chest. You can't breathe. Uh, you tremble. You're dizzy. You're nauseous. It's, it's bad. Now I've had three in my life and it's rough. So like if you've ever had to experience it, I totally understand how stressful it is. Uh, some people, when they have one for the first time, think they're having a heart attack due to your heart racing and you're not being able to breathe. So you go into the there and it's it's not. It's actually your anxiety is just out of control. Um, but you do. You can feel like you're dying. But once you've had one, the subsequent ones you can kind of identify, okay, this is a panic attack. I need to calm down, but you still go through that intense dread and kind of shortness. Like you still kind of go through it. It's just a little bit easier to get through because you can kind of talk yourself out of it uh, versus uh, the first time. The first time was rough uh, just because you didn't, I didn't know what it was. And most people don't know what it is unless they've had family members who've had it in the past. Okay. Phobias. Phobias are fun, but they are actually an anxiety disorder. And it's because of irrational fear causes you to avoid certain situations or activities. All right. For most people, the phobia is very specific. You are afraid of a snake or bugs or heights or blood or close spaces, whatever those things that actually that you're afraid of, you just literally avoid them. Now, most people say they have a phobia of this. Like I will tell you, I have a phobia of open water. But true people with phobias, if you didn't get what that means, I, I just don't like being on boats in the middle of water, um, will have like straight panic attacks when presented with this, whatever their trigger is. So, you know, if they have a phobia of blood, they may pass out by just the sight of blood, or they may go into full panic flight mode uh, and like run away. So it causes an intense reaction to that object. All right. Um, for most people, like I said, most people can live with their phobia and rationalize themselves out, but others can go catatonic or whatever. They just, they cannot handle it. You have social phobias, guys. This is not just being introverted. This is not just being really shy. This is where you have an intense fear of others. Like you're afraid they're going to scrutinize you and you pretty much avoid social uh, situations. And it can actually cause you uh, to actually have physical reactions to social situations, sweating, trembling. You can actually have stomach issues. Um, pretty much you go into a panic mode when presented with a social situation that you were not prepared for. Most people with social phobias really have to walk themselves and talk themselves into dealing with people socially. Um, and many of them choose not to. Uh, now, they might be okay in a group as long as they're not having to talk or prepare. So like if someone has a social phobia and they get called on in a classroom environment, it could cause them to have a panic attack in front of people or it could cause them to shut down where they just don't say anything. All right. Then you have agoraphobia and agoraphobia is a fear or situation where you cannot escape. All right. What this means is that like, you're so afraid to leave your house because if you go out in a car and you get stuck in traffic and that car catches fire, you can't escape it. It seems kind of silly when you think about that because we get in cars all the time, but this is it, it agoraphobia is so just uh, 
incapacitating because people literally will not leave their house because they're afraid they can't escape to get away. So like, I won't go to the mall because I could get kidnapped at the mall and I can't escape to my car or I can't be in crowds. It causes me unease and I think I can't get away fast enough if something happens. You're just constantly worried that you cannot escape a bad situation. So most people with agoraphobia literally stay home. Like they just don't go anywhere because they're afraid of some kind of thing in the outside world. Okay. So now OCD. OCD is, <sighs> okay, let me explain this. So you may have something that is a tick, like I have to color code my entire closet, but, and it might bother you if that shirt that your mom put in there yesterday uh, does not match your color coding. However, you can still go on with your day and do normal things. Now, if you were OCD, you would literally tear it out of the closet as soon as you saw it and fixed it, and then proceeded to maybe having some kind of repetitive thought about it. So now you need to check it over and over and over again that all of your clothes are in the order that you want them to be in. Not just putting that clothes, that, that one back where it's supposed to be. I'm talking you constantly go through to make sure they're all and their specific spot the way they're supposed to be. Uh, the one that everyone knows for... A bit one second. Hey, sweetie, I'm doing one of my screencasts. I'm leaving. Okay. Um, <laughs> so one of those, uh, the one that we all know is like washing your hands over and over again. So it's not just cleanliness. Like think about now everyone's washing their hands more and stuff. Like this is washing your hands so often that your skin becomes raw. Uh, that's not normal. <laughs> uh, the thing about OCD is it usually shows up in your early to late teen years. Um, and it's only about two to 3% of the total population that truly become OCD. And just like with GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder, this lessens. For most anxieties, they lessen as they age. You get better at handling them, and then you ultimately just kind of mellow out. Now, that's not always true. There are some people that are just as incapacitated by OCD for their entire lives, but for most people, they kind of just calm down. There's an exception to this, and that is PTSD. Now, I have heard, now I don't have PTSD, but I have heard that it sometimes does get easier to manage as time gets further and further from that event. So PTSD is where your memories come back to haunt you. Um, it will, it can take over your lives and it can be absolutely terrible to deal with. Now I, I don't have it, but I actually do have a lot of friends that have it being in the military and it can manifest in many different ways. You have haunting memories, nightmares, social withdrawal. That's a big one where people just stop kind of doing the activities they like, uh, which is also a sign of depression too. Um, you have kind of this like jump anxiety, hear a loud noise, it causes you to jump, um, can't sleep at night because if you sleep, you're going to have nightmares, uh, so on and so forth. And like I said, this is normally known as a military thing. And it's because there's a large number of people in the military that have it due to combat experience. However, you can get this from a really bad car crash. Uh, you can get this from being assaulted. You can get this from any sort of trauma and it doesn't necessarily have to be physical it can be mental trauma too um this is it pretty much what happens is the greater your emotional distress is during the trauma the higher uh, high likelihood of risk for ptsd um ptsd is actually an issue for both police officers emts and firefighters as like coming up on a bad car accident i've heard especially with children uh, I had a friend who was an EMT and had some issues due to a, a car accident that he had to go to. So you don't have to be a soldier to get this. And I want to be very clear about that because I think people... Um, Hi, sure. I, you okay? Yeah. I think people uh, think that only soldiers can get this. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So why do we experience anxiety? So what is causing, oh, one second, Ricky, you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah. Um, can you help your brother? That scared me. 
Yeah, Bubba's gonna help you, okay? All right. So why why do we why do we experience anxiety? Here's the thing, guys. Anxiety is actually a good thing for our well-being. Having anxiety, having fear, having this stuff was a condition that allowed us to survive early in our evolution. If you are afraid of things, that helps you stay vigilant. Okay, boys, I need you to leave. I'm asking what he wants. He wants gummies, sweetheart. That's why I pulled him out. Um, sorry. As I'm sure you guys are enjoying NTI, so am I. All right, so. Uh, also, too, guys, if you observe a lot of fear in your life because maybe your parents was a worrier or they're constantly freaking out about stuff. It can also actually increase your anxiety too. Um, so we can be conditioned by observing our parents and our family members who are also being, uh, who are also possibly having it. And actually for people who have anxiety, you're much more likely to have anxiety if a parent or family members have anxiety. Cause again, I think there is some observational to that. Like my grandmother. My grandmother, although never tested, definitely has GAD. 100%. Anyways. Um, then again, think think of this way too. The idea that through natural selection, there are certain things we're predisposed to fearing. We feared bugs, especially bugs that could bite and sting. Snakes, large animals. These things are natural to be afraid of because they cause us some kind of pain, discomfort, or even they could kill us. So. When you see a snake, even if you're not necessarily afraid of it, you are conditioned uh, due to natural selection to be have some fear towards it. Jump at least away from it, even if you know you go back up and look at it afterwards. That's why, like, if you've ever swam in the ocean, even though the ocean might not freak you out, but like something brushes your leg, you might freak out for a second because you don't know what it is. Now, if you saw that it was seaweed, you'd probably be okay and move on. But yeah, until you identify what that object that touched you out of nowhere is, it, you have a natural instinct to react to it. And then again, Gene, and I said that before, you might be predisposed to this. And we're going to talk a lot about that with the other disorders. A lot of those other disorders you're predisposed to. So if you have a family member that has it, you're more likely to have it as well. Okay, so we're going to talk stoform, st stoma to form. I'm tired. Uh, and this is where you believe you have some kind of issue, um, medical issue, but there's no bodily symptoms. Everything is mental. Uh, there's no physical signs. So there's two types, and you've heard of one for sure. Uh, the first one is conversion disorders, and this is hysterical blindness or paralysis. Guys, you can get put into such a situation that you're so afraid and you're so traumatized that you actually lose your vision, even though there's actually nothing that is preventing you from seeing. You mentally have blocked out your vision or you've mentally para uh, paralyzed yourself because of this. And it does happen, although this is fairly rare. Um, but someone who's experienced maybe trauma or abuse or some kind of uh, thing may go into hysterical blindness, usually some like a, watching someone die or something like that. Uh, then there's uh, hypochondriacs. That's the second one. This is where you're so worried about your health, okay? You're so worried about your health that you feel something's wrong, even though nothing is wrong with you. Every little thing. This would be like looking at your arm and you see a mole. And maybe that mole's been there. Maybe it hasn't. And you're like, I have skin cancer. And then you go to the doctor trying to confirm that you have skin cancer. When it you might just be a benign mole. But you always think the worst and you always think you're sick. All right. And it's hard to break out of it because, you know, it's such a compulsion almost to believe that you're ill. All right. So then you got dissociative disorder. So you have uh, dissociative identity disorder and you have dissociative uh, you have amnesia and fugue. Amnesia is the one you see like stereotypically on movies and stuff where someone gets hit in the head and they can't remember who they are. Uh, fugue is periods of time and it's not so amnesia you don't and I'll talk actually I'm going to see this another slide. 
Uh, anyways, and then dissociate identity. Let's go to the slides, and then I'll explain each one. So, guys, these are incredibly rare disorders, um, and you become disconnected from them. So, sorry. Uh, I guess I don't have individual slides for these ones. So, amnesia, like I said, you hit your head, get hit with something, and then you just don't remember anything from your past, or you don't remember large chunks of your past, Okay. Fugue is different. So fugue is also kind of like an uh, amnesia period, but it's a very specific time frame. So it's like when you go into the fugue, you don't remember who you are. Uh, potentially you don't, <coughs> or you remember who you are, but you don't remember anything you did for the last three weeks. You just were in the fugue this whole time. Um, so it's not short-term amnesia. It's, it's actually its own thing. Then you have dissociative identity disorder, and it's similar to both of them where you lose track of who you are. And that one we'll talk on the other side. You disconnect from a part of yourself, okay? So it makes it kind of interesting um, how that works. But you disconnect from that. Uh, it's interesting that with dissociative disorders, it's usually some kind of guilt or aspect of their life that they can't acknowledge. They just, it's such a uh, traumatic thing for them to acknowledge this event. They block it off. And that blocked off part of their memory becomes their own identity. All right. So this might be where you hear about people, um, you know, one day just disappearing and then they end up in another part of the country with a completely different identity. Um, and it's just concept, uh, separate from the identity they left. All right. So they block off part of their memory, completely separate identity. So dissociative identity disorder is really interesting. Um, it is not schizophrenia because schizophrenics don't, uh, their, theirs are a little bit different. What causes like the voices in their head, so to speak, or their other identities. All right. All right, mood disorders. Mood disorders is where your emotional state is affected, okay? There are several types, but we're going to talk about mania, bipolar, and moderate and severe depression, okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is major depressive disorder. And for the most part, this is what finally brings people to seek mental health counseling and services, all right? You have to have five signs of depression, which is lethargy, kind of a hopelessness or worthlessness, loss in interest, uh, withdrawal from families and friends, um, so on and so forth. And then this needs to last two or more weeks and cannot be caused by drugs or a medical condition. All right. So some uh, and this is, can be prescription drugs. Some prescription drugs. Boys, can you go into a different room, please? Heath, uh, Ricky, can you go downstairs or go into your room? No. Sorry, apparently mommy's home and now I have to be the center of attention. Ricky, I need you to go. You're being loud, sweetheart. Huh? All right. So, it could also be from a medical condition. Um, actually, females, you can actually have such a uh, bad experience with your period that it can cause depression. I didn't know this until I, I had to go talk to someone about my anxiety. Um, so they had to actually rule out that it wasn't due to my period because apparently there are depressive disorders that are specific for that. So like there's actually medical conditions out there that can cause depression and they have to rule that out before they can actually diagnose it as major depressive disorder. So then you have bipolar disorder and there, this is where you go through extremes. Uh, you have extreme uh, mania, which is okay. This is, this is where you have extreme mania. This could be a period of euphoric, so meaning happy, hyperactive. Uh, you could be wildly optimistic. You could actually be very, very angry, though, too, or easily irritated. 
Reckless behavior is very common in this. And this is where a lot of bipolar start using drugs. So on is during this like period of like, everything is great and I am invincible and I can do anything. Uh, some bipolars, when they experience a traumatic episode, maybe spend their life savings on something like some kind of shopping spree that, you know, as a sane person would not make any sense. All right. Uh, the interesting thing too, though, with bipolar disorder is that uh, a lot of people who are bipolar in their manic episodes have these like crazy bouts of creativity. Uh, they do maybe their painting or their music creation, all in these kind of manic episodes before they go into the depressive episode. Because that's the thing with bipolar. You have these manic, happy, go lucky, everything's great, or, you know, maybe kind of ornery episode. And then you go to the depressive, everything's terrible, regret all the decisions you made when you were manic type episode. So, uh, the depression, again, we, uh, we talked about it can cause like the lethargy and, and with bipolar, it can be an extreme and severe depression. Um, many people who are bipolar have experienced suicidal ideations, self-harm and other things due to the effect of the depressed depression side of it. All right. So what causes mood disorders? Um, the thing is there's several reasons one can cause. It can be, it can, can cause like, so, with my case, mine is actually caused by my anxiety and eventually gets too much and it breaks into a depression. Um, they can come and go. Like, that's the hard part with mood disorders. You might be great for years even and then have a major issue or major stressor in your life and goes into uh, your depression. You can have, it could be from poor self-image and when you think of mood disorders, those are usually the ones that are highest at risk for suicide or suicidal ideations because you do go through this low and it's kind of this hopeless pit. Uh, and I think that's what's hard for people to understand. They don't understand the feeling of depression. You truly feel when you're going through a depression episode that you are a failure and that you cannot change it. It is hopeless. I, I am helpless. I cannot, I am a burden. Like all of these thoughts go through your head. And so it's very hard if you don't have good family support and good uh, people to help you get out of that hole. It's very hard to get out of it yourself. And so that's why mood disorders can be so hard on the individual. And it's, there's stigma. There's a stigma with mood disorders uh, that there's a weakness there, but that's not true. Um, you know, you could have, had gone through some terrible experience in your life and depression just kind of cycles through every once in a while when you're highly stressed. It could be from other causes like anxiety or um, high stress to where, you know, you just, you're, you can't handle that anymore. No matter how good you were at handling it before, you finally hit your point and you can't handle it no more. All right. So let's talk about psychiatric disorders. Now, normally guys, these are like three separate classes. So I'm trying to do it because let's be honest, for most of you guys, this is why you took the class. And it sucks that we cannot dedicate a week like we normally do to this. So I apologize, but that's okay. So when we talk psychiatric disorders, all right, this is any disorder that causes a major disorganization of thought. All right, so what I mean by this is for most people, when they think there's some kind of method and fluidness to it, people with, uh, that go through psychosis end up having some kind of break of thought causing disorganization. And this causes confusion and extreme emotional responses to it. All right. It is an incredibly serious mental disorder. All right. And it's not necessarily developed from lesser disorder. So like, you can't have depression, no, that you can't have depression and a psychiatric disorder, but it, your, your depression is not causing the psychiatric disorder. It's a separate issue from there. Now, the same stressor you're going through may exacerbate a psychotic disorder, uh, but it is not from a lesser mental disorder, okay? So, in order for you to be considered uh, going through psychosis, meaning that you're having a psychotic break, all right? You have to have serious distortion of the mental process. 
you, they cannot, like, you cannot understand what they're talking about or what they're talking about makes no sense. All right. About how, uh, the government, this is the idea of like, that it's just all over the place. They're, it might as well be talking gibberish to you. Right, that is the disault, the thought disorder. They're not linking sentences necessarily the way they're supposed to. Um, seeing or hearing things that are not there. All right, this comes also with some paranoia, which is outstanding. Um, this is where you think that there is, you know, a ghost in the corner, and you can see that person, or there's there's bugs um, crawling on my skin when there's nothing there, like you're seeing or feeling or experiencing something that no one else can see or experience because your brain is just hallucinating what's going on. Okay. Hold on to inaccurate beliefs. This is probably the most interesting and this is probably the most obvious sign that someone is going through a psychotic break, uh, is that they believe they are, you know, an FBI agent. I actually talked to someone who had was going through psychosis. Uh, he said that he has been part of government organizations his entire life. You know, he was there when JFK got shot. You know, he got to meet these presidents. Um, you know, it pretty much the government is controlling me and talking to me through uh, the windows and stuff. It was it was really different. Um, there's delusions that you know I'm an angel or I'm you know, this, and it just, it's uh, crazy. And that's what you think of like in the movies where you see like the crazy person with the tin foil hat on. Uh, that's that idea that they have this like delusion that they don't wear that hat. The government's going to steal their thoughts. All right. Um, and then not responding correctly to emotional responses. Uh, this is where your emotion is inappropriate for the situation. Um, but it's due to the psychotic break. Like it's not just because you're a jerk or because you're just socially awkward. This is like being told uh, your grandma died and then laughing hysterically like it's the funniest thing on earth. Or, uh, you know, somebody says, excuse me, and then you completely blow up in their face like as they're like the worst person ever and they're trying to steal my thoughts. And yeah, stealing my thoughts thing just got in my head. All right, so it's completely inappropriate for what's going on. Um, the most serious of all mental disorders, though, guys, is schizophrenia. All right, now, the schizophrenics that you hear about are uh, the paranoid kind. That's the kind that you see. These are the ones who, again, think the government's trying to get them, uh, may have the hallucinations, are always constantly uh, on edge, edgy, thinking like something's going to come and get them. Uh, there's an, actually another type of schizophrenic, which is catatonic. And when they have that kind of episode, they actually don't speak or move. They just kind of are th like lay there. Um, they're not actually out of it. They're actually experiencing a different, almost like a different reality to ours. When they go through these psychotic episodes, they truly, in their mind, are seeing and hearing uh, those, you know, different voices and stuff like that. All right. This is where, um, again, they're not, not just out of it, but they are actually believing what they're seeing and so on. Because it's so, so clear in their mind on what schizophrenia is. All right, as many as one in 100 people have a form of schizophrenia. Now, like every other condition, the level of schizophrenia is different per person. All right, uh, they may have hallucinations. Uh, they may feel or see things that are not there, or even smell things that are not there. Um, this is, you know, they have delusions. Um, the appropriate motion. But again, this is because of splitting from reality. All right. I hate to say it. Schizophrenia shows itself usually in late adolescence or early adulthood. All right. Both men and women are affected, but men seem to have the more severe cases of schizophrenia. So it's kind of a hard thing to understand, but some of these conditions don't really show up until your teenage years or even your early adulthood years, which is actually the same for autoimmune diseases for a lot of people. Not that they can't happen sooner, but um, they usually they, they start to kind of show up in your teenage years. 
All right, so why? Why do people have these disorders? Well, it could be, it could be due to brain abnormality. Um, it could be an too overactive dopamine, which causes a intense brain signal. Um, it could, your brain areas are just abnormally active versus another person. They do believe that actually having a virus during mid-pregnancy um, can impair fetal brain development. And depending on the study depends on what percent risk that actually poses, uh, which is actually why doctors push for women to get their flu shots during pregnancy, uh, because the flu shot can increase your risk for several things. But this is one of them or the flu, getting the flu during pregnancy can do that. All right. So also there's genetic factors, guys, that can lead to this. Um, having a mother who is schizophrenic, it does increase your chances of it. If you had a birth complication like low oxygen or low birth weight, uh, being separated from your parents at an early age. Uh, and then, you know, if you have kind of disruptive behavior patterns um, early in your childhood can show an increased likelihood of it. But again, just because you have one or two of these does not mean that you are going to become schizophrenic. Or right? even if you have a parent who is schizophrenic, it does not mean you will be schizophrenic. Now, what it does mean is that your um, chances of schizophrenia are much higher uh, than maybe the normal person's. But by much higher, I still mean your chances are probably around the 10% mark. Um, so it's still not incredibly high. Okay. My favorite disorders to talk about because these ones are the hardest to diagnose in so much as people who have them rarely seek out help unless they are forced to. And these are personality disorders. And this is where we get to talk about psychopaths and uh, all that stuff. Because unlike psychiatric disorders, uh, personality disorders, people are not crazy. They may act crazy, uh, but they are only acting in their own self-interest. So what is a personality disorder? It is a disruptive, inflexible, and enduring behavior. All right. This impairs social functioning. All right. A personality disorders, so they are different because they are not detached from reality. They understand what is society, society expects is right and wrong. They understand what that means. But they do not show guilt or remorse for something they do, even if they know it would be against social norms. Guys, they do not experience guilt. Even if they say they experience guilt, they do not experience in the way someone, uh, a, a person who does not have this disorder experiences it. So there are two types, all right? There is antisocial personality disorder, which is psychopaths, sociopaths, all right? And there's borderline personality disorder, which is far more common, and we'll talk about that one in a second. So sociopaths, psychopaths are pretty much interchangeable, guys. Like, it's... They did have slightly different meanings and people try to no. people who have conditions that we would consider to be psychopathic are actually have what's called antisocial, uh, antisocial personality disorder. And this is the people who become serial killers or they can commit uh, axe murders or they can beat up little old ladies. All right. These are the people who do these kind of, uh, like these kind of like stuff that you would think is egregious someone who can't help themselves they don't have guilt or remorse from those actions okay so they are typically male this seems to affect males more than females although females can also have antisocial personality disorder and <clears throat> They have a lack of conscience, and this also is very obvious to see before the age of 15. Unlike the mental disorders that kind of crop up in your teenage years, someone with antisocial personality disorders oftentimes had obvious warning signs as children, and they have other things. They don't call it antisocial personality disorder as for a child. It would be a conduct disorder, which is like a behavioral disorder, or a um, there's... There's a reactive attachment disorder, which is where uh, you don't attach with people. So like you, these are the kids that like talked about killing people and stuff um, that killed animals that, you know, did inappropriate acts out in public, uh, gets in the fights. Inappropriate sexual behavior is very common with people with antisocial personality disorder. 
Um, being stated, about half the children that do display these tendencies become antisocial. When you are an antisocial adult, adult, you have a hard time keeping a job. You're very irresponsible as a spouse and parent. You can be assaultive or criminal. Like a lot of criminals have this condition. Being stated, if it is caught early enough in childhood, many of them can recover from this and go live absolutely normal lives. Uh, even if they still are not 100% empathetic uh, or have guilt, they can at least get to the point where they understand their consequences and agree that it might be great to follow society's rules because it's more beneficial to them. This is why like some very high power people can be considered antisocial, uh, like CEOs, uh, people that don't, the people that are in power that you don't see have empathy. Um, being said, they still have parts of their life that they're not in well control over. And that's usually like, even though there might be this high power CEO, like their family life's a mess. Uh, because eventually people find out, like people with antisocial personality disorder have a hard job maintaining the social lies because eventually their lies get found out or they start to get more aggressive or something else. Um, the problem is, is when you combine this condition with intelligence and amorality, which is a big part, meaning that they don't have morals, um, this is where like the serial killers come in or something like that or con man's. Uh, who are able to swindle people out of millions of dollars. All right. Uh, most, and a good chunk of criminals, criminals, even though I said that like they are likely to become criminals, actually are not antisocial uh, by definition because they actually have concern for friends and family. Um, a true person of antisocial, with antisocial personality disorder has no concern for anyone except for maybe one two people and only if those people benefit them you gotta understand like it's all about them if you don't benefit them then you don't need to be part of their lives if you're not helping them they could easily just stab you and walk away uh so the only time they show any maybe concern and concerns kind of used lightly here is if that person has a benefit to them all right the thing is is that to put it even worse they don't have fear or if they do have fear it's it's more like they just their fear is actually getting caught more so than you know uh, there's like a thrill to what they do um and again this is what causes those serial killer kind of episodes uh the thing is is that this does start for many of them as early as the age of three and people with this condition on average, have like 11% less frontal lobe tissue. Remember, frontal lobe is your judgment, guys. That's your personality. That's your ability to be human. So having that impaired in any way can lead to this kind of lack of empathy uh, that you see with someone who's antisocial. All right. Now, borderline. I had a soldier once who had this condition, and it is absolutely a mess to deal with. Honestly, the reason I actually went to go look for behavioral health services and have to go talk about my anxiety is because of this soldier, all right? So borderline personality disorder is someone who has massive mood swings and uh, this kind of uncertainty, and this causes their intenseness uh, and their ever-changing list of what their interests and values are. Okay. A person with this condition views things in extremes. It's either all good or all bad, and you cannot, you cannot get them to understand the middle ground at all. So with my soldier, all right, she blamed the army for everything going on with her life when it was not, I promise you, it was not the army's fault. She, what, what it came down to, she didn't want to work anymore. She didn't want to have to come in at 0630 and get off work at 5. And, like, I totally get that. But there's a way you do it correct in the army, and that was not the way she wanted to do it. She wanted to get separated, so she got money, which, I mean, is all and fine. And, and honestly, we probably would have separated her for a family care plan, which is what she was trying to go for initially. But then she changed her mind, and then she did this, and then that wasn't good enough, and then she wanted to get med boarded. It, because she couldn't understand, because of her extreme ideology, and the fact that she kind of swung back and forth so fast what was the most logical way? And it was either her way or the highway and the screaming matches, the, the army, you know, doesn't care about my family, which, okay. 
does the army as an institution truly care about my two individual children? Probably not. But they also give a lot of stuff to my family in order to make my children comfortable. And of course, if something were to happen to them, they would probably truly, most of most of the people in my command, be very sympathetic and human about it. Like, you know, in the army, if you have, there's plenty of times I was able to leave work without having to take time off to go take care of a sick child. So there's benefits to the system, but in her mind, she was it was all or nothing. Oh, well, I have a child who can't go to daycare. The child could have totally gone to daycare. And uh, she has extreme attachment issues. And if I leave her there, she cries all day. Well, but here's the thing. She's eventually gonna have to go to school. You know, how are you helping her to limit this? And that was the problem. Like the excuses she made were probably fine for a short term until something got resolved, but you can't just not like she wanted to work a half a day. If that you can't do that, but because of her extreme thought, it was constantly this. So the idea is that in her mind, the army abandoned her and was actively trying to, uh, you know, harm her family, even though that wasn't true at all. Um, her relationships are often like her, her relationship was very intense and unstable. Uh, relationships are intense and unstable. People with this condition, um, get very clingy and very jealous. Uh, as soon as they get in a relationship like, and, and they'll be the greatest person ever at first, but it'll quickly turn into a dependency almost. And if you threaten to leave this type of person, um, they may actually threaten to kill themselves or you, because again, there there is extremes. Um, there, it's almost like their mind is made up that this person is their identity now. Um, so, this kind of distorted self image. They're very impulsive and do dangerous behavior. This is the person that, after a bad breakup, will excuse me, will try to run their car off the road. Or in the case of my soldier when she was upset with the army because we didn't do something. I don't even remember what we didn't do. Um, she decided to get in her car and just drive away, leaving her three children at home with no supervision until, uh, the husband came home from work, um, just up and left. And we ended up finding her about two and a half hours away before she finally like talked to somebody on the crisis line. Uh, self-harming behaviors and suicidal ideations are common. A lot of people with this condition do get hospitalized at some point because of that. Um, and it get in these intense moods. Like she would come in one day so happy and it was fine. Like she actually would do a little bit of work. And then the next day she would be, it's almost as if she was bipolar, but it wasn't the bipolar. She didn't have bipolar disorder. It was due to this personality disorder that she had. Um, and again, it's controlling anger, like slamming doors, breaking things. That was a common fixture for this and not getting her way was a big deal. All right. So what plays into this kind of the same things we've talked about before, um, ha family history, having a close family member, um, brain factors. Okay. There can be changes in area that control impulse that cause this. And then actually there are some social cultural factors. People who experience trauma or abandonment as a child may end up having this condition. It's, it's just very interesting how this all works. But these are just some of the conditions that can affect the brain. We have this complex thing in our head and it can cause so many different problems if it doesn't work correctly. All right, guys, I know this was long, but I wanted to get them all out there. I don't even know how many of you guys even watch these anymore. <laughs> but hey, take a look at this. This will help you all for tomorrow. All right. So I'm going to get off here and I hope you all have a great day. All right, Let's see if this is going to actually do that for me. Like I said, sorry this one was so long. Um, sometimes it just doesn't want to work. And I'm just staring at you guys for like an extra minute. All right, I'll have a good night.